FPG Voices is brought to you by the following sponsor. Board and Dice creates games where strategy and family fun collide. Some of their latest releases are La Granja Deluxe Master Set, Books of Time, Barcelona, and Nucleum. Their ally program lends support to underrepresented voices in the hobby. everybody, I'm Starla. I'm Mick. And we are Our Fantasy Plays Games. Games. Voices, <laughs> boom! Yay! Yay! Yes, and we are back for another week. Yes, we are. And we have an awesome show for you. Yes, we do. Yes. We are going to talk about transportation games. That's a whole ton of them. A lot like, of them. A lot of them, <laughs> yes. And, of and course, a lot of good ones. Yes, and of course we've got some great contributors. Yes. We've got Drew, who's going to give us a top five list. Yeah, okay. Okay. And then Marcus Ross is going to come through with some designer tips, you know, for you game designers. Yes, here we go. Yes. And then guess what? What? Mick and I are going to review some transportation games. I have one. Yes. And Mick has one. I have one. (laughs) Yes. Yes. But first, family, let's go to our Good Humor segment with another guest contributor, Mae Beasley. She's going to say some good stuff, y'all. Here we go. Mae Beasley from the Instagram channel, America Trash Talk. I am a mom and a teacher and a gamer. And I'm really, really excited and humbled that I was asked to host this week's session of Good Humans. I struggled to find what I really wanted to talk about, but at the core of my heart, I am a teacher. I run a board game club at school. And I was thinking about things that I teach my kids to help them be good humans as they're navigating their new lives and they're going into the world. So I'm gonna teach you three things that I teach my kids on how to be good humans and try to give you a board game example of how this could work and help our community be more inclusive and help us get along a little bit better. The first thing that I wanna talk about is entering from a place of curiosity and not a place of judgment. So when we are interacting with other people in the community or we're bringing new people into the community, I feel like you would be a better human or you'd be a good human by entering from a place of curiosity, but not judgment. An example of this could be when a new board gamer or not even new, somebody who's transitioning out of more casual games into heavier games, into hobby games, comes up and says something like, oh, I'd love to get into games. And we say, oh, that's great. What games do you like? And they say, my favorite game is Monopoly. That's what I see. Oh gosh, no, not a Monopoly. There's so many better games than Monopoly. That's a place of judgment. And when you enter into a conversation from a place of judgment, what happens is the other person shuts down. They feel like you already haven't accepted them. You're pushing them out. They don't belong. And that's never a good thing. To be in good ambassadors of the hobby and to be good humans in general, we want to enter that space with questions versus judgments of that person. So an example of this whole conversation being different, but entering with curiosity and not judgment goes like this. I'd really like to get more into board games. Oh, that's great. What's your favorite game? Well, my favorite game is Monopoly. Oh, that's wonderful. What is it that you like so much about Monopoly? What's your favorite part? And that person might say something like, oh, I really, really like when I buy a spot and then somebody puts their piece on it and they have to give me money. That signals us as board gamers that have been in the hobby for a while that that person really does enjoy the concept of engine building. And you have probably hundreds of engine building games in your head. And you can say to them, Oh, wow, that's amazing. I know a lot of games that have something similar to that, that same feel. Would you like to try one? And most of the time, they're probably going to say yes. And then you've already hooked them in with your curiosity about what they already enjoy versus judging them off the bat and shutting them down. So my suggestion for number one of being a good human in our space is to enter from a place of curiosity, not judgment. The second thing that I teach my kids that I would like to 
put into this segment is talking about when we speak up, like when we say something. And I always tell them before you wait, just say something, <laughs> we should ask ourselves some questions. The first thing is, what is my res desired result? Like, why am I saying it? Then, is it helpful and is it kind? If it's not helpful and it's not kind and it's not going to get you your desired results, you probably shouldn't say it. And that, I feel like, still applies in the board game community, particularly to our interactions online. Because there's so many of us and we all want to talk about different things in the space. There's also so many games and games are art. So they're subjective. What sometimes happens is somebody will post about how much they like a game and they won't ask what other people think of the game, but we feel the need <laughs> to trash the game, to tell them everything we didn't like about it, even though they didn't ask. And we have to ask ourselves, what's the desired result of that? I have no idea. So you would have to answer that for me if you're somebody who did that. Um, is it kind and is it helpful? And if it's not any of those things, then do we need to say it in the first place? This also applies like at the table. So for example, somebody might take a turn and they do something inefficiently. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's a turn. And it's inefficient instead of like going at that person and being like oh my gosh i don't know why you did that you should have done da, 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 da. what's the desired result is the desired result to like teach them what they should have done is it helpful maybe maybe it is but is it kind is the way you said it is the way you presented it kind kind of goes back to the first one like enter with curiosity not judgment maybe it's just Hey, why'd you do that? And then they might explain it to you. But just to like enter in with like they did it wrong, that doesn't feel kind or helpful. So why would we say it? So I just think before we talk to each other in any capacity, whether it's board games or anything else, we should ask ourselves, what's the desired result? Is it kind? Is it helpful? And if none of those things ring true, then doesn't need to be said. Third and final thing, but it's definitely not the least important, comes from actually a PD that I took a couple of years ago. And the PD, the norms were to recognize intent, but to speak to impact. And since that PD, I have always taught my kids to do this. To recognize intent is to go into something assuming the best that the intent was not malicious. Um, the intent was either normally to be funny or to be informative. Um, but sometimes even when you're trying to do those things, it impacts somebody some type of way because of their personal experiences or their upbringing or whatever, right? But we don't always know those things about each other. So recognizing the intent is being kind by allowing and giving the person who's seeing whatever they're saying the benefit of the doubt at least the first time and i just tell the kids like the first time you can just assume that they didn't know and that is from a place of love and, and understanding that everybody doesn't know everybody's situation right they don't know you um but speaking to impact allows you to voice why what they said bothered you or impacted you in any type of way because being a good human to yourself is allowing yourself to take up space and feel like you belong and if you never speak to the impact of a situation or to a comment then that person may not know that it's doing that to you and you're going to continue to feel unsafe um when it's possible i'm not saying it's always gonna happen but it's possible that there really was no ill intent and it will never happen again if you just let them get to know you a little bit better. So a low key example of this would be something like somebody's table generaling you. So you go to make a move in a co-op game and then somebody tells you like what to do. So you might say, I know that your intent was to be helpful, but the impact of that makes me feel like you don't value my opinion. 
and that you think I don't know what to do. It's very simple, right? The intent, you, you're in, you're telling them you know that their intent was to be helpful, but you're you're speaking to how that makes you feel in the space. A kind of like larger key example of that would be something like somebody says something like sexist or racist as a joke, right? And being a female in the space and also being Filipino American, that has happened to me in the past. So the way I would approach it is just with honesty that I know your intent was to be funny, but that comment affected me in this way. It made me feel this type of way because I'm female or because I'm Filipino and it's hurtful. And nine times out of 10, and when in my experience watching children do this and doing it myself, the person never does it again. And they, because they didn't know, they didn't know that it was offensive to you. They didn't know it would hit you like that. They may not even know that you feel that way about it. So from a place of love for yourself and being a good human to yourself, I think a very powerful thing would be to recognize intent, but to speak to impact. Thank you so much for joining me for this session of Good Humans and learning three tenets of being a good human that I teach to my kids. One is that we should always enter a conversation with curiosity and not judgment. The second one, asking ourselves before we speak, what's the intent? Is it kind? Is it helpful? And finally, being a good human to ourselves by recognizing intent, but speaking to the impact. I hope you have a wonderful week and happy gaming. Bye. What's happening family? It's Andrew here with Table Talk and today I'm bringing down my top five transportation games. Starting with number one, this game is all about intergalactic transport. It is a light to medium weight real-time game called Galaxy Trucker. In this game, you are assembling a intergalactic transportation ship sadly made out of sewer pipes because your company is cheap and you are trying to transport as much goods across the galaxy as possible while keeping your ship and your crew alive as you are going to be facing meteors and pirates and space wrecks and you have shields and guns and cargo holds and crew members and aliens to help you out but you have to assemble this whole ship in real time and then go through this event card deck and see what ultimately happens. Try to bring the most cheddar home by selling the most goods and keeping as much of your ship intact as possible. It is chaotic, it is fun, still strategic. You just gotta be okay with some of the stuff you build getting destroyed because it inevitably will, but everyone else's will as well. And this is the number one transport game Galaxy Truck. Number two transportation game involves ship transport, and this is a game called Jamaica. In this game, you're trying to race around an island and use your cargo hold to transport as much stuff as you can most efficiently, as you're gonna be storing treasure. Hopefully not, but sometimes cursed treasure, food, guns, and sometimes crew members to ultimately try to get around the island as best as possible, as you're gonna be firing guns at other Ships, try and use the dice and cars as most efficiently as you can. Throw cursed treasures on your opponent. Get as much treasure as you can. Have enough guns, have enough food to get around the island quick enough to ultimately be the winner in a very, very fun light to medium weight racing game with some transportation. This is Jamaica. My number three favorite transportation game involves train transport. And in this game, a train is trying to transport its passengers and goods across the wild, wild west and hopefully not get robbed too much. But you and your opponents are gonna be playing those very bandits trying to rob as much loot as possible. Gems, briefcases, in a lockbox with a lot of dough as you are firing at each other, throwing each other through other train cars, punching each other, climbing up the roof, climbing down, trying to avoid the good marshal that's trying to stop you guys from stealing in a chaotic, fun, interactive, lightweight programming game called Colt Express if you want a lot of fun, that Wild West theme, a 3D train that you are running around as bandits shooting each other and stealing loot. Look no further than this train transportation game, Colt Express. My number four favorite transportation game is Survive Escape from Atlantis, where Atlantis is slowly sinking in this 3D island and you are trying to get as many of your survivors transported on boats 
to safety as possible. They're going to be worth a variety of different points, and your opponents are going to try to feed your survivors to sharks and sea monsters and all kind of other things like whirlpools and volcanoes. And you might actually sometimes have to work with those very opponents trying to destroy you as you might climb in the same boat and argue about how to get best to safety in a very combative but ultimately lightweight family game with a ton of interaction, a lot of take that and fun in survive, escape from land. My final top five transportation game is a Stone Cold classic in the modern board game hobby, and that is Ticket to Ride. In Ticket to Ride, you're gonna be trying to build the best transportation network of trains across different countries. And what I love is it has this very, very simple runny style rule set that's really easy to pick up. You can introduce to almost anybody and who doesn't love collecting sets of cards and trying to fulfill goals. Also, I love the variety of experiences you can get in the Ticket to Ride universe. You have a legacy style experience with Ticket to Ride Legacy, a kid's experience in Ticket to Ride First Journeys, a USA experience of people in the US, the original, if people are in Europe, there's a Europe version, there's maps from all over the world, so if you like tech and technology in your games, you can go UK or Japan maps. If you like very combative tile maps, you can go Africa or India, and also if you like teams, you can go Ticket to Ride Asia, and if you like two to three players, you can go Ticket to Ride Nordic Countries. There's so much variety, and there's a reason this game is so popular, and that people love the Rummy style playset with these train transportation networks where you get to throw out your trains and build up as best you can while trying to block your opponents and ultimately score the most points in my top five transportation game tickets to ride. With all that being said, I'm gonna catch you guys on the flip side. All right. Thanks, Drew, for that awesome Yay. top five. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> like a lot of those games he had on the list. Yes, yes. me too. Yes. <laughs> so I'm gonna do my own review. Okay. Because we just could not agree on which transportation no. game. You're gonna do hers. So he's gonna do one. I will do mine. All right. So yeah. I'm gonna kick it off. Okay. With Pan Am. Okay. It's a 2020 game from Funko. It, fun game. Yes, it fun is. Fun game, family. At one point in time, mm -hmm. Pan Am was like one of the largest it airlines was. out there. Yes, it was. It was taking over the world yes. with its planes and all the places it traveled to. Mm -hmm. And then here you come along competing with Pan Am with really? your own airline, that's trying right. to take some of their territories and destinations yep. and all that. Yep. And that's the fun of the game. Mm -hmm. I mean, this game, you're gonna deal with some hand management, mm -hmm. you got some worker placement, you're gonna do some bidding. Yes. I mean, there's all kinds of things you're gonna be dealing with, with trying to get your piece of the pie from Pan Am. Yes. But it's all about airplanes and travel. And I mean, this board game, um, you've got this wonderful board. Now, when you look at the board, it can be a little boring because it's just blue. And then you've got all the continents and stuff yeah. in kind of yeah. a whitish gray color. And then it's got routes on the board and everything. Mm -hmm. But then you've got these cute little planes. You know, I've got little yellow planes and green planes and, you know, gray and all that. So you got to put these planes on the board uh -huh. and all that. So once you finish, you know, the game at the end, it really has presence because you see yes. all these planes yes. that have gone to these different destinations. But from the onset, the, the board is just a little to me boring. It's not, it doesn't really? have that color, doesn't have yeah. that punch that I'm looking for. Okay. But the gameplay is solid. Yeah. And then you get into the history of Pan Am. Yes. You get into the history of what they were doing back then, you know, with, with uh, transportation and planes, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's a really fun game. It's an interesting game. It's an yeah. interesting looking game. And, and I really enjoyed it. Now, one time, you know, we would, we talked about this before, We've and had, you said yeah. you didn't like the plastic planes. I did not. Yeah. I, I still don't like yeah. the plastic yeah. planes because they're a little on the light side, the cheap yeah, side. Are. But, I mean, you get in this game at retail, you know, they were. And you get it anyway. Yeah, you, you get you, it at anywhere. one time, you got it at Target. Yeah, yeah, Target. So they tried to keep it reasonable for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, would I like to upgrade the planes and make them better? Yeah. yeah. But other than that, the game is great. The yeah, game is really fun. It's great. Because you, you got, you know, Pan Am gobbling up everything. Thing, like Pac-Man, yeah, you, you gotta you fight. Know, you, gotta you gotta fight. fight him him. He's trying to, you know, get routes and you know, yeah. get destinations and airports. Exactly. You know, so it's a fun game. Yes. Fun game. All right, so I picked for my transportation game, Magla's Metro. Ooh, I like that one. From Be uh, from Bezier Games, 2021, one to four players. Yes. Now Magla's Metro is a really cool 
pick up and deliver game. Yes, which I love. And also you're building routes and stuff. Yeah. Now the one thing you loved about it, and it's really cool, is the colorful translucent tiles that kind of go over each other. Well, no, because they're, they're not colorful. They're clear. They're clear. The, the, the tiles are clear, which clear. I thought was with really nice. Color, it, yeah, but, with but a little the color. routes have color. Yes. Got that one little route and then they connect so well. Yes, and then you put them on top of each other yes, so you looking like a route through. board, yes. you know, because you're going to go to different yeah. areas, mm -hmm. but you might be going to the same area too. Yeah. And it's really a fun, t it's a, like a tiling game. Yeah, and I, I haven't seen another game do that where you Me have, either. you know, see-through tiles yeah. that you can see all the way through. So you can have four players and put those four tiles and you just see, all you see is the route. Yes. But the actual tile itself is clear. And I thought that was so unique. And you have, a, you know, a couple of different maps where yeah. you're trying to replace mm -hmm. the old subway system with this new subway yeah. system with this levitating magnetic mm -hmm. you know, magnetic lines. Mm -hmm. That's you where know, the maglev yeah, the maglev comes metro from, comes yeah. from. Yeah. <laughs> and so you're trying to get workers and robots around the city. And you're trying to make sure you match them up with the right places they need to go to get yes. points. Mm -hmm. So it's a really cool game they have so they did an expansion i think last year that they you know brought it in new maps mm -hmm. even one on the moon y'all yes. even one on the moon we did a preview for that one yeah. but it was really fun it's a really fun kind of you know pick up deliver mm -hmm. and, and it adds a few more mechanics in there that really make it a fun fun game well i just yeah. thought it was fun when we first saw it we were at pat yes we're packed and we got a chance to play it yes and i was just floored i was blown away by it and really the tiles and also the gameplay. The play. tiles really got you. Yeah, the tiles, the tiles got me. Really it was very you. pretty, yes. very unique. Yes. And then the gameplay because I like pick up and deliver yes, games. Yes, you do. Yes, so you I, do. I just thought it was great. And you know, really to me, both of these games, I don't think they get enough love. No. Uh, they don't. Well, it, unfortunately, Pan Am will not be around anymore oh. because, you know, Funko mm -hmm. and, uh, that's you know, right, that's Funko right. got sold and, yes, you know, we don't know if that game is going to come back or not with the new yeah. owner, Goliath yeah. game. They, so They may come back. I hope they hopefully, do. Hopefully, hopefully it out this time. Bling it out. <laughs> bling it out. You know, because I, I really trying to see how could I bling it out mm -hmm. with the airplanes and stuff. Planes, yeah. Because Pan Am is a fun game. It is. It has been forgotten. It has. And it is a they did a really good job totally on agree. that game. They did I a great job. I feel the same way job. about Maglev Metro. Yeah, Maglev Metro. Yeah. Really well done. Yeah. Fun game. It's really just not game. enough attention. It's not getting attention. And it has those. that real nice balance of it's a medium weight game. It is. It is not gateway. Not and it's not mm -hmm. too heavy. Mm -hmm. It's just right in the middle yeah. that gives you enough strategy that it keeps you interested and you know you don't find many like that you, you know nowadays mm -hmm. so and it's a really fun game yes yeah. so yeah. those are our transportation yes. games yes so next we're going to hear from marcus ross all right hi i'm marcus ross with water bear games back with another segment for ofpg voices this time i'm covering playtesting the most important part of your game design process playtesting is where you take your prototype game present it to other people, and have them play it to find the fun and uncover the flaws. This can happen at any stage of the game's design, from early concept to the final rule set validation. Playtesting is different from just playing the game in key ways. The primary goal is generally not entertainment, but work. Every part of the design can be up for scrutiny and subject to change. You're trying to find out which parts of the game are performing well, and getting data to refine the rules for your next playtest. Prototype games for testing don't need to look great. They just need to be functional enough to test the concepts and be graphically laid out in a way that doesn't hinder usability. Prototypes do not generally need illustrations, just placeholder images to distinguish the components from each other at a glance. In general, if you're still developing the core of your game, you, your prototype shouldn't be that polished. Uh, a great looking prototype will actually discourage your playtesters from giving you full and honest feedback. It's obvious when a ton of time and effort has been put into making a prototype and people can be reluctant to tell you if anything's wrong with it because so much effort's been put in. If I'm doing a playtest and I get the feeling people are feeling that way, then I'd take a Sharpie and I'd write directly on some part of the game, and it just lets people know this is a game that's still in development. The changes you suggest could be things that make it into the game. In the earliest conceptual stage, you should be playing your game entirely by yourself. The first way you respect your testers' time is to not show them things that are so obviously broken that you could find them on your own. When I have something playable, I take it to my group for alpha testing. I keep an evolving set of rules in Google Docs, but not in a super formal layout until I'm quite late in my process. In my later design stages, I like to teach the rules verbally and have printed copies of the rules and player aids available for players to reference during the game. This closely mirrors what people are expecting when they play published games. And when I do that, I don't answer rules questions afterwards. I let them reference the rules so I can test the rules and the game at the same time. So decide your goals for your playtest. Is there a certain scenario you want to test or is there a player count you are interested in? 
In any case, let your players know what their commitment is, the type of game that it is, how long it's going to take to play. That way they can decide before you get started if they're going to get involved. Uh, and if it looks like the game's going to run long, stop the game and ask people if they'd like to continue or go straight to feedback. You don't need to finish a game to get actionable feedback. When possible, I like to teach the game, but then sit out and watch it being played. If I remove myself from the game, I can focus on how the players are receiving it. If I were actually playing, I would focus on my design strategy. But by sitting out, I can watch them come up with their own strategies and do things I wouldn't have thought of. And I'm also free to look at their cards and ask them questions and things I wouldn't be able to do if I were playing the game myself. So while the playtest is happening, I'm taking a bunch of notes on everything. If a player is delighted or disappointed, I write it down. If they're frustrated or say something odd about their position, I write that down. If a player is taking too long and another player picks up their phone to check Instagram, I'm writing that down and underlining it. My notes are my reference for determining what needs to be kept or changed between tests. Otherwise, I'm looking for patterns. Common mistakes, points of confusion, or misinterpretations of the rules are prime pandas for changes. I'm most interested in discovering if the game is inspiring the feelings I intended or not. I need to remember what happened during the test to be able to make those changes later. When the game is over, invite everyone to tell you absolutely anything they want about the game. This is the most exciting, most important, and often most difficult part of playtesting. You will have spent a lot of time designing the game, and people are going to tell you things you probably don't want to hear. And a lot of designers are going to be tempted to fight against any negative feedback they get from their testers, and I'm urging you not to do that. It's vitally important to honor the choice your testers made to play your game instead of doing literally anything else on Earth. Respect their choice by truly listening to their accounts of the experience they just had. The math you did at home, the justifications you made, the simulations you ran, they can't compete with how actual people playing your actual game felt. Actively listening means recording their feedback and responding to questions you're asked. Explain, but don't defend your design choices. Make sure to give each person a chance to say something. The more open you are to receiving the feedback, the greater chance it will be offered. If you defensively shut down one person, you're going to discourage anyone else from telling you anything that can improve your game. Sometimes people will make specific suggestions for changes. They could be things you've already tried, write them down anyway. You do not have to commit to doing any of them. You're the game designer. You get to decide what goes in the game and what doesn't. But listen carefully for any underlying issues they're trying to address. If multiple people are telling you the same thing and they're trying to fix the same problem, then it's something you should consider changing because it's a problem with your game. So getting good playtests can be kind of tricky. I primarily do mine with my game design group that meets at Spielbound Board Game Cafe every week. But one of the ways I especially love to get feedback is going to protospiel events. These are small weekend-long conventions that are held at a hotel and entirely devoted to prototype gaming. So no published games are even allowed on the tables. And because of the nature of that event, most of the people that are attending are other game designers. So you'll be playing with people who understand what you're trying to do. This is especially valuable because I get fresh opinions from people who haven't played my game or been exposed to any of the prior versions. It's important to keep in mind that most of the time you'll be playing other people's games at Protospiel. So at the last one I went to, I played my game three times, but I played 22 other prototypes. Uh, playing those other games as a tester makes me a better designer. Knowing that I'll be called upon to provide feedback makes me more conscious of the choices I'm making and the strategy I'm pursuing when I play. Thinking about my motivations, player agency, the reasons I'm taking the actions I am is good practice for figuring out how my own games are working. All right, I've rambled enough. Get out there and make some games. I'll see you next time, everybody. All right, we want to say thank you so much for joining us today. Yes. And thank you to our awesome sponsor, Board and Dice. Yes, go check them out, <laughs> y'all. Check them out. Support and, them. And our wonderful contributors. So, Drew and his top five. Yes, I love <laughs> Drew and his top five because he's had a lot of games that mm -hmm. we have played mm -hmm. that are in our collection. Tickets to ride. Come on. We got about tickets 50 tickets to rides yeah. up in here. Yeah, it's all you about know. transportation. And, and what I love about Ticket to Ride, you know, if you don't want to give somebody, you know, the starting mm -hmm. out, you know, the big the, the big North American or the, you know, yeah. the Europe or anything yeah. else, give them the small, small city small games city. that yeah. only, you know, only it's real small box. Yeah. It only takes about 15, 20 minutes to play. So it's so many opportunities yeah. to show them about transportation games. Yeah. Because that's all what they're all about. Now, the one that kind of threw me for a loop was Survive Escape from Atlantis. That is... It, it threw me for a loop for transportation. Loop, but it is transportation because you're trying to get... On a, a boat. A boat, <laughs> trying to get to them different islands yeah. and people acting a fool trying to get you all eaten up. <laughs> I love so, it. When he first said that, I'm going, 
Okay, transportation, but yeah, you're getting on a boat you're and you are boat. you are being transported you to another get place. It. And we have had some great <laughs> times with Survive, yeah. Escape from Atlantis. Mm-hmm. This has been some great times. And they are coming out with a new version yeah. uh, pretty soon, yes. Now, the two others on this list I have not played, and that's Galaxy Trucker. Yes, I heard it's and, a great game. And Jamaica. Yeah. And I heard that's good, too. Yeah, but, you know, he, he explained it so well, and yes, they are did. transportation games. Yes, they so, are. Yes, they are. <laughs> so, great list, Drew. Yes, great list. And then Marcus. Yes. I I'm telling you, Marcus. He be was, dropping some some <laughs> some wisdom. He be dropping well, wisdom. And on I totally us. agree with him. Yes. About play testing. Oh my God. Please. Yeah, play please. Test. Please play, play, play test your games. Go to Unpub or right, any of those like you know different things like Spill Masons yes. at what they were doing at uh, you know Spillbound Cafe. Yeah. Go to those things. They, they help you yes. to get better. So your game will not act the fool with us when we see it. Oh, yeah. no. And, and and don't be afraid of constructive criticism. Yes, don't be afraid. You want your playtesters to give you honest feedback. Yes. And you need to listen and take that feedback yes. and utilize it yes. and make your game better. Don't go to your yes. friends and family all the time. So go so, to oh, different great. folks. Oh, they're going to say, oh, this is, it needs to come out tomorrow. Yes. No, I do not. No, yes. no. Get you some unbiased yes. Yes. Play testers. Yes, and I, that, I think it's great. I think that's the one thing that we see a lot uh-huh. as content creators, yeah. where they we ask, "Have they played this game with us? Like, what's going on with this? <laughs> what is happening to this game?" Yeah. So yes, please get play testing like crazy. Exactly. Yes, do that. And last but not least, yes, we have to say thank you to May Beasley. Now she has an Instagram and a YouTube channel called Ameritrash Talk. Yes, she gave us a great good human segment. And she just wants to share three things that she teaches her kids. Mm-hmm. And it's so cool because she is, she be teaching, boy. She's one of my favorite teachers out there. <laughs> and and family, check her out on Instagram. She be doing her stuff. She be working out. I mean, she's a weightlifter, all that stuff. Yeah. Maybe getting it out. And she be trying to fight her husband in competition like me and Starla be doing. <laughs> and they actually give an award yeah. for who wins. I love that. I love that with May and her husband do that. But May is good people. Check out, and she really, you know, she said, don't judge yeah. with that game Monopoly. <laughs> don't judge. May, I'm trying, yeah. May, I'm trying not to judge. Yeah. So thank you for letting me know. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really enjoyed her message, and thanks again for being on the channel. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, May. Thank you, thank you. And love you now. Love you. Now, Starla, what about our merch? We don't have it on. <laughs> Well, but what if, about it? if you're looking for a shirt for Our Family Plays Games yes. or OFPG Voices, yes. you can check us out on Spring. Yeah. And then we also have a new shirt for Our Family Plays Games yeah. on the BGG online store. So be sure to check that out as well. Now, family, make sure you like this video and all the others that you see of us that kind of help us. And also subscribe and get other folks to subscribe, too. Come on. Let's let everybody see these lovely voices and, and join in this community. But now our next episode is April 11th and the topic is going to be uh oh cooperative games can she do it family can she do it <laughs> we'll see we will see <laughs> now Starla where can they find RPG and RPG voices out here come on let me know well if you're looking for our family plays games yep. our RPG voices yep. you may find us on Facebook uh huh Instagram, yep. Twitter, yep. right here on YouTube, right here on our website, website, and TikTok. TikTok, TikTok. Family, thank you so much for coming out and checking out these lovely voices. Make sure you you definitely take a look at our sponsor, Board and Dice Games. Support them because they keep supporting us, so we want to help them out. So definitely check them out. And family, if you have any questions or comments, please put them down below. Hey, and there's one thing, one thing we want you to always know, family, we love you. Bye, Bye now. Everybody.